Hello, uh, my name is Henry Gurr. Uh, this is the uh, 3rd of April, 2022. And today I'm going to uh, uh, record here, video my talk, uh, which was um, uh, prepared for the S uh, Southern Society for ph Philosophical and uh, Psychological uh, meeting, which was, um, my talk itself was uh, given on the 1st of April, just a couple of days ago. The title of my talk is uh, based on observation, a new and vital uh, view or theory into how our mind works with the discussion and demonstrations, uh, and, but uh, very little explanation. Anyway, uh, the one thing I did tell the audience there was the uh, previous talk uh, was given um, uh, the day before called Toward a Principle to Typology of Thought and Thinking Beyond a Dual Process uh, Theory. And uh, I wanted the audience to be sure to understand that, um, yes, my uh, theory is dual process. Uh, one way of thinking about um, the idea of dual process theory is uh, given in a lecture or a book called, excuse me, a book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Slow and Thinking Fast. Uh, the thinking uh, slow is uh, what I'm doing right now and what you're doing. Uh, the thinking fast is uh, comes by automatic processes spontaneously uh, from an unconscious from unconscious brain processes that suddenly gives mental arrivals, such as a flash of insight or epiphany, or a light bulb came on as in a cartoon. Uh, it dawned on me. Uh, these different um, uh, mental arrivals uh, uh, come from, as I said, unconscious brain processes. So thinking slow is conscious thinking, it uses words, it's what we're doing now. Uh, the thinking fast part is automatic, spontaneous, comes out of unconscious broad, uh, brain processes and you only know it when you have the flash of insight or other mental arrival. Now, I do want to say about uh, the ideas I'm trying to present and my uh, theory in general is that it's uh, uh, very new to everybody uh, uh, with many unbelievable parts and, uh, and ideas. And, and uh, the ideas are so unfamiliar that you'll have to work quite hard uh, to see into what I'm trying to point out. So uh, the, uh, what I will be doing is uh, presenting to you as an audience uh, various problems for you to solve and uh, your solutions will come out of your uh, unconscious mind uh, thinking fast uh, as a solution with a mental arrival and the, I've been told that the way to start, start a talk and get uh, the audience attention is with humor. So I want to start with a a story uh, with a problem to be solved, uh, which goes back to Richard Feynman back when he was giving his lectures on physics uh, back at Caltech. Anyway, uh, uh, I was giving, giving his lectures. One day he was uh, uh, talking to the students and uh, being very uh, concentrated, as he always is, with lots of good ideas. And as he was lecturing, uh, finally a, a student said, uh, say, uh, Dr. Feynman, uh, why do you pace back and forth so furiously? Dr. Feynman uh, so, uh, got, was thinking about this. Uh, he didn't know an answer. He thought about it, thought about it, you know, me, uh, pace back and forth uh, furiously, um, and thinking and thinking, and he really didn't have an answer. And then all of a sudden, oh, I know, flash of insight. The reason I pace back and forth like this uh, so furiously is I need a way to know if you really understand uh, my Feynman's lectures on physics. And if you really do understand uh, what I'm saying, 
I will know this because I see your eyes going back and forth like this as you follow me. Hopefully uh, you saw the humor um, in that. Um, and uh, of course what we have to see here also is Dr. Feynman uh, presented with a problem at first not knowing the answer, thought about it and thought about it and finally with um, a thinking fast suddenly a flash of insight uh, where he had the answer which was there whole and complete. So um, now you as an audience uh, also were presented with a problem namely uh, what was funny about uh, the story about uh, Dr. Feynman and he suddenly um, uh, have the correct uh, answer about watching the students back and forth. Uh, hopefully you saw the humor there and suddenly came into your mind uh, uh, what was funny. Now let's, uh, now let's try another uh, uh, problem to solve. Uh, this one is from uh, Reader's Digest uh, many years ago. Uh, a young man, uh, down his luck, was um, going from house to house in a wealthy neighborhood uh, looking for work. And finally, a, a sympathetic homeowner said to him, yes, uh, he could paint his porch. Uh, and uh, the, back in the garage, now notice that word garage, would be, he would find the paint brushes and paint uh, for the job. And a couple of hours later, a, a young man came back to the front door uh, to collect his pay and then said as he got ready to walk away, uh, oh, by the way, sir, uh, it's not a porch, it's a Ferrari. Now, of course, you have to think about that and suddenly put together that the Ferrari is a sports car and uh, the porch was not a wooden thing out in front of the house. The porch was uh, what's otherwise known as a, a, a German a sports car called a Porsche. Uh, and that's what got painted. I told this story to one person and he went like this with his eyes because he visualized how bad the Ferrari now looked with a um, amateur uh, paintbrush job on it. And now one thing you should be seeing here uh, is that your problem-solving brain, uh, given the problem, uh, what's the with the punchline of the joke, um, and uh, lots of times you're thinking about it. There's a delay. Your your body is motionless, and, and there's no expression on your face. And then suddenly, the answer will hit you from unconscious, spontaneous uh, brain processes. And there was, a, with a flash of insight or another mental arrival, there's the answer, out of the blue. And this is in a relatively short amount of time, and you suddenly have a laster, laughter, um, joy, uh, pleasure with having gotten the answer, and uh, tension with uh, tension released. Now let's try uh, some other uh, problems to be solved. Uh, question, what did the little grape say when a person stepped on it. Nothing. It just let out a little whine. Grapes let out wine in a whine. Got it? Now another one. Uh, how do you get down from an elephant? Think about, think about that. The answer, you don't get down from an elephant. You get down from a duck. Think about that one, think about that one. And a click, uh, this is a more difficult problem with more delay, more tension, but then suddenly laughter, as you see the point of the humor, the punchline. The, of course, down from an elephant means climb down, but down from a duck means the soft fluffy feathers, which is also down in your mind, must uh, connect with that uh, conjunction. Now another uh, problem to be solved, uh, this is from Groucho Marx, he uh, said to the telephone operator, 482, 482, eh? Sounds like a cannibalism story to me. Of course, you got to think about that one. And all of a sudden you realize 
482, the, the number is 482, uh, also translate into the four ate as food, the number two. Now, you will notice that jokes and humor in particular, uh, this, this, this arena, is where um, our, uh, the flash of insight is um, played upon uh, the, uh, the jokes and humor and other form uh, 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 play upon our brain's natural ability to solve uh, the problem and see what is funny, followed by successful solution and uh, a pleasure, reward, and laughter. And now, of course, remember this uh, pattern of a flash of insight, uh, solution type mental arrivals. There's first of all the presentation of the problem. Oftentimes there's a delay with no answer. And then suddenly the answer uh, occurs spontaneously, automatically by unconscious brain processes. And the answer uh, arrives instantly into your uh, conscious mind and you now see what's funny. Now, please note well and uh, remember all of this. Uh, now, one of the things that um, uh, is true for most people is the, if you ever heard of the flash of insight, you're probably inclined to think of it as a mental event as a peculiar, a sideshow, uh, a minor um, out of the blue uh, mental event with little significance. Uh, but uh, to the contrary, I hope to convince you that the flash of insight and other mental arrivals, as I've been discussing, are center stage. Oh, they, uh, and if you study the flash of insight uh, and other mental, sudden mental arrivals, you find out some very important properties of how our mar mind works. And now one of the important things to mention here, as soon as you see and understand um, the flash of insight mental arrivals, you and the brain processes unconscious that create them, you will then realize that those same uh, brain processes operating on a near continuous basis are what's running our mind all the time. Uh, the difference being is we just don't know it. We don't know our mind is running this way, but the flash of insight, well, what's important here uh, in sudden mental arrivals is to see the nature of what can happen, how good it is, and realize that illustrates what our brain is doing all the time. Any discussion, any questions here? This is Henry Gurr with a continuation of the recording of uh, my talk, which is a new and vital unified uh, panorama view into how our mind works in the creation of conscious awareness, which is uh, mostly uh, discussion and demonstrations, but not explanation. Now, in, in my uh, Feynman joke, you experienced uh, a flash of insight, a, a type of sudden mental arrival, and um, this uh, theory of how our mind works uh, using uh, the flash of insight was developed during my 35 years of study of, of the consequences of the uh, very general uh, mental arrival uh, events, uh, such as the flash of insight, also known as insight or sudden aha or inspiration, it dawned on me, a lightning bolt, lightning strikes, a Zeus, epiphany, revelation, a light bulb turning on as in cartoons. Uh, these uh, can be collectively called a, a sudden mental arrivals into our conscious mind. But uh, I've, I've already mentioned a little bit uh, these sudden mental arrivals are entirely from completely, uh, entirely from completely hidden and entirely unconscious brain processes. Uh, there is, now there's very important reasons why we don't know uh, what our uh, mind, our unconscious part of our mind is done, doing. Uh, basically the reason is if we uh, consciously knew what our unconscious mind was doing, we would, it would effectively interfere with it. And, um, uh, and change it possibly, but I hope you realize that um, 
the unconscious brain processes should go to completion as they've already started with no external botheration, certainly not by from our conscious mind, which is by far less uh, capable, less uh, powerful. And um, an another aspect would be um, uh, if our conscious mind had some way of knowing what the unconscious mind was doing, that might constitute a, a form of a bad positive feedback. Uh, and there's more about this on my web pages of, of my theory. Now I must I want to move now to uh, show you a picture of a Dalmatian, which is a, another kind of a problem to solve. Uh, it's, it's kind of a puzzle picture. Now we're going to turn on, I hope, the uh, projector here. Um, anyway, um, here we have back, the, I hope you can see it. Uh, we can turn off the room lights, um, and um, the Dalmatian, I want to kind of make sure you really can see um, on screen, yes, that's fine. Um, uh, of course, if you've seen this picture before, uh, seeing the Dalmatian's not the least bit difficult, you'll see it right away. Uh, those that are new to the picture, uh, sometimes uh, it's quite a puzzle because there's just a scatter of black and white. Um, and uh, the fact that there's a dog uh, in this picture is um, beyond your ability to find it. Uh, so and now to see the Dalmatian, uh, right here is the uh, Dalmatian's nose, the head is up like that, there's an ear, uh, the shoulders of the Dalmatian are there, the back of the Dalmatian up over like that, and a little hard for me to see, uh, one hind leg is here, another hind leg is here, and this is a, a front leg right there. So again, uh, front leg, nose, head, shoulders, uh, tail's not visible, and the back leg and the back leg. Um, and uh, one of the points I want to make here is that uh, in this puzzle picture, once you've seen it, it's easy and quick. Your problem-solving brain automatically finds it. Um, if you haven't seen it, and I hope uh, you, some of you had the experience of all of a sudden your problem-solving brain going click and there was the Dalmatian. Instantaneously, automatically, uh, and wholly and complete. And of course you can then now see that, well, this is probably just scattered leaves. You can pick out that this is a tree here and this is the shadow of that tree. So uh, the point there, and now one of the things I do want to add here is uh, when you're learning about my theory of how our mind works uh, use, uh, and, and trying to understand the role of the flash of insight and other instantaneous uh, mental arrivals, uh, it will be difficult. It will be hard to see. You have to work hard, hard, work hard at it. Like, like seeing the Dalmatian before you ever experience this picture. But like the Dalmatian, once you see my theory, you'll see it easily and wholly and complete. It just, I hope that will give you a, a, a good reason to, to study my theory and work hard at it. Now, um, and so that's the Dalmatian picture. And uh, next I want to show you a, uh, a Necker cube. Uh, which is uh, on a handout I gave to my talk. I hope you can hear me way over here. The, uh, so scrolling down, uh, here is the Necker cube. Uh, and the importance of this demonstration is, uh, and you'll, maybe you'll, is the following. Uh, even though these are just bare lines, the, the, uh, the most minimal um, presentation, drawing, uh, this is nevertheless, your problem solving brain can see this in three dimensions, even though it's on a flat surface. If you stare at it, you're, at first you will see the green dot is, so to speak, on the back side of the cube in, in a, in a uh, three dimensional view. Stare at it, maybe upwards to eight seconds, and pop, the green dot will move to the side in front. And if you keep staring at it, another eight seconds later, the green dot and will pop to the back of the cube. Keep on watching, keep on watching, it'll pop to the front of the cube. Now, um, 
you may have to stop the video and stare at this on your own while the video is stopped in order to see these. Uh, to see your uh, problem solving brain, see this in three dimensions, but on account of the fact that the, that the uh, a Decker cube is um, ambiguous, there's no perfect answer, it's bistable, they say. Uh, your brain, uh, it's, it's amazing, shows you both views alternately uh, because either one might be possible. And that's amazing that our brain uh, can do that. Uh, so remembering that, there's another figure uh, called the, uh, which is here, uh, called the uh, Schrodinger stairs. And uh, like the Necker cube, uh, uh, you look at it, and uh, because it's ordinary stairs, then most likely you'll be seeing um, uh, the stairs as per normal. You could walk up those in three dimensions. Uh, this surface A is toward you, and the surface B is uh, like in three dimensions further away. Now, if you stare at it and stare at it, and this is more difficult, um, uh, you keep staring and keep staring, the, so to speak, the neurons saturate uh, for the one view, and maybe what will happen is pop, it will reverse, so the stairs in essence are upside down. If you try to walk on them, you can fall off. Uh, this surface A is now to the back, and in three-dimensional view, the surface B is now uh, closer. Uh, now that's another one that's more difficult, but uh, what's to be seen here is your problem-solving brain uh, automatically, spontaneously, uh, with this uh, figure called the Schrodinger stairs, because again, it's ambiguous, it's bistable, both views are equally valid. Uh, your brain will uh, instantaneously switch from one view to the other uh, to show you both, uh, kind of uh, pretty amazing. Now another uh, um, exercise uh, to, uh, for you to see similarly your brain at work is this uh, crater picture. Now you may have to uh, get a crater picture on your computer um, in order to see uh, what I'm saying or maybe even take this picture and, and uh, or, or a, another version of it, you can get these off the internet, um, uh, print it out on paper and uh, hold it. Um, I'll, I'll get a uh, copy here uh, to show you uh, this next part. Um, so print it out and this, uh, your problem solving brain will be operating on, again, another type of bistable um, uh, view. Uh, in this case, uh, if uh, the illumination, uh, normally when you see a crater, uh, what you will see is if this is the bottom of the crater, it is, it is farther away from you. And because the, when the meteorite hit uh, uh, the moon, uh, they liquefied things and, and splattered outwards and left a upwards pile of rubble. Uh, they, so this part, the rim is up and the bottom of the crater is down. Of course, this in the middle is a, again another lift up uh, higher. Now, if the room illumination is coming in uh, from this um, a direction, like, like on this uh, piece of paper, um, I hope I get enough illumination here, uh, the, uh, on this piece of paper, uh, if the illumination is coming in this way, um, naturally, what will happen is um, it can, no, no, I've got the reverse here. If the, if the illumination is coming this way, uh, bright light can hit this, making it a, 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 a surface raised up. Uh, illumination uh, can hit the side of the crater, making that lifted up. And, and of course, this uh, far side of the edge of the crater is dark. Uh, and meaning that this is a, uh, a higher edge, making a shadow. Now, if you take the picture and rotate it on printed paper like this, and, and go around uh, essentially 180 degrees, uh, the illumination now will be coming in uh, in such a direction that um, uh, it will um, uh, when they illuminate. Um, the edge of 
the bottom, so the bottom looks like it's higher and make shadows uh, on the edge of the rim in such a way that makes the edge of the rim look lower. You know, uh, I'm not explaining this good enough, uh, but you, you can see this uh, in, um, uh, on a piece of paper, just rotate compared to an extra light coming in a side window, the crater will be correct. You keep on rotating 180 degrees, the crater will reverse, uh, and then rotate 100 degrees, it could be a crater will come correct. Uh, something you don't realize when you're looking at a picture like this is that your uh, problem-solving brain uh, includes the illumination of room as you're looking at even a, a, a piece of paper uh, picture. Uh, and um, because uh, both views are valid, uh, center down or center up, uh, your brain shows you both of them. Uh, uh, curiously, uh, for the crater picture, the Decker cube and the Schrodinger stairs, it doesn't, your brain shows you only one at a time, one good solution, the best solution. It doesn't try to show you both of them at the same time. Rather, it just flips between. Now, another uh, uh, moving ahead, uh, also on the handout, uh, is um, a now a much, much uh, more difficult uh, viewing task which is um, uh, shown here. And this is another one of the views that you may have to print this out or, or uh, a piece of paper or uh, stop the video uh, as you attempt to look at uh, this figure. Now to explain a bit about what's going on here, um, the, in the, uh, back in the 70s, the um, uh, organic chemists were very proud of the fact that they could work out not only the shape of particular organic molecules, that they could figure out the uh, three-dimensional layout of the molecule. Now, of course, in order to publish the results in, say, a magazine, it would just be on flat paper. They could not supply a stereopticon uh, uh, viewing device, uh, nor could they include a, a what you had would have had as a, um, a child a thing called a Viewmaster. You stick this wheel down in there and the Viewmaster is showing through one eye, one view, and a slightly different view to the other eye and because you're able to, um, to comfortably view both um, views in each eye respectively, suddenly your brain can take those pictures and make three dimensions. A lot of fun. That's why Viewmasters are so popular. Well, uh, magazines can't give you a uh, a Viewmaster uh, to come with it. So you have to learn how to do it yourself. And um, if you look at uh, this picture, possibly printed out on paper, uh, and you hold a piece of paper like this, or you might go stop the video and see this on your screen. You look at it and, uh, for example, uh, look at something off the distance without changing your focus, move your eyes down to the top of this figure and relax. Uh, what you will see uh, as you're looking, uh, you'll see on the left side this picture and you'll see on the right side this picture and in the middle kind of a scramble which is a, a mixture of both of these. And in the middle you'll see two hexagons. Uh, focus you, your attention on those hexagons, that's these, uh, which these two hexagons may be close to each other. Just keep watching and keep watching and keep and relax and keep watching and all of a sudden your, med, your brain will move those two hexagons on top of each other and at that point bloop, the whole picture will come out in three dimensions. I gave this uh, talk to an audience uh, uh, some years ago and when the, uh, the person who was successfully using that case, the, my paper handout, and I heard them go, oh, ho, 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 and start laughing, meaning they had gotten the three-dimensional view uh, of these two figures on flat paper. So uh, the point here is, um, like the flash, like um, Dr. Feynman's uh, puzzlement, you're looking at the Dalmatian picture puzzlement, the, the Necker cube, or shorting your stairs. Your brain is given a job. And in this case, you take these two figures and make a three-dimensional figure, and it does it spontaneously, automatically.
but in the case of this particular picture, it's a whole lot more difficult and a little whole lot harder. And as it takes a longer time, you get tears in your eyes and you gotta come back later. But sufficient to say this, well, the important, uh, importance of this exercise is it shows your brain trying and trying. It slows down your perception process, slows down your problem solving brain so you can watch carefully, not getting it, not getting it, not getting it, but finally bringing these together and then whoop, automatically, spontaneously, click the correct answer, and one just correct answer. So uh, remember all of those um, uh, characteristics, please. Uh, can, and I now, I think I should turn off the projector and um, uh, move on to the next topic. Uh, let's see, I turn on room lights and we'll turn off the projector. Um, There. Now, um, one of the things you'll notice uh, about our, our mind or our problem solving brain is that um, um, it, it is a, a persistent and important characteristic or property of our mind that if there's something that is uh, confusing or puzzling, our mind or our brain will swing over there and bring it to our attention. For example, if you're in a construction site and all of a sudden there's a nail sticking out of a board, your eyes will be drawn to it and you'll stop and look at it. I remember years ago, I'm walking in a woods uh, trail and I, my foot stopped off the ground. I was just about ready to step on a, a six foot black snake. Uh, my attention was drawn to something, in this case, bad. Um, and uh, an example of uh, this happened to me. I was um, uh, looking at, uh, in my, on my laptop, uh, I had Chrome browser up, and the whole complete uh, uh, Chrome browser page was there. But since I hadn't clicked on anything, uh, uh, anything for the browser to show, it had the Chrome uh, uh, icon in the middle of the screen, and, and right down here was a fuzzy patch beside it. And I, I look at that, and, and what's that fuzzy patch? My mind was instantly drawn to a puzzle. Remember this about how our mind works. And uh, of course, I had drawn to the puzzle, I looked closer and looked closer. And finally, as I was watching the fuzzy spot, all of a sudden, it changed, just like that. Automatically and instant, automatically, spontaneously changed from a fuzzy thing that I couldn't understand to it was actually my uh, my profile picture on uh, on Google. Uh, I, and the important thing is drawn. I was drawn to it automatically, and and spontaneously and automatically solved the puzzle by looking at it. Now a particular thing to bring to your attention here is the following: the whole browser frame was all clear. The Chrome uh, icon symbol in the middle with all those colors was perfectly clear. The only thing that didn't, wasn't clear was uh, the fuzzy spot. And I call this partial fit. Um, and I, this is a major, major topic that uh, I deal with on my uh, web pages uh, at, with the following conclusion. Everything our problem solving brain gives us is a partial fit. Some of the partial fits are very poor, some of the partial fits are good, some partial fits are excellent and even the best. There's a complete range of partial fits uh, and this has lots of consequences, I'll discuss several of them. But in this particular case, the partial fit was the following, the whole screen, everything on my, on my computer screen was clear, but the thing that didn't fit was the fuzzy spot. So partial fit, everything except this. Um, and, uh, but the solution happened automatically. Um, and um, uh, one of the things you will see in this similarly in writing composition, you will, uh, you're typing away and you've got your writing on your computer screen, uh, such as I'm, uh, you know, such as I typed all my documents here, you'll have a pretty good sentence. Uh, 
a good fit. But as you look at that sentence, uh, and maybe think about it a minute, you know, wait a minute, that sentence is confusing, and you, you puzzle over that pump, a better uh, a series of words will occur to you and you can type them in. So in this case, the partial fit is a fairly good sentence, but there, a much better sentence was waiting. All you had to do was think about it for a bit, uh, possibly um, look away from the page, uh, take a break from your typing, and come back, and then you have a better partial fit uh, in your writing composition. This is a Henry Gerr with a continuation of my uh, talk, uh, which is titled A New and Vital Unified Panorama View, a Theory, into How Our Mind Works in the Creation of Conscious Awareness. Uh, this is a description demonstration and, and not much um, explanation beyond um, telling you about the, the Hopfield Neurotal Network model. So uh, one of the really noteworthy and quite amazing things about our uh, problem-solving brain is it will automatically uh, bring back to us again and again uh, important unfinished business, uh, projects we've meant to do, uh, uh, things that remain undone or loose ends. Uh, these uh, at uh, quiet moments when we're not doing much else, I call these uh, moments of consciousness unoccupied, uh, it'll come back to us in a flash of insight, a, a, a spontaneous mental arrival, and there's this project I need to do, or this other thing that uh, must be done. Uh, and the interesting thing is that these will keep on coming back and, and, uh, until such time as you actually do them. And quite amazing, uh, because normally when you uh, go ahead and, and do something, uh, it adds to your memory and makes it easier for something to come back to mind in the future. But the projects that needed to be done and now are done don't come back anymore. Uh, now, in a similar fashion, there are things that have uh, uh, happened to us, uh, uh, bad instances, things we wish hadn't happened, things we've had regrets about, mistakes, uh, near misses, uh, accident, or maybe a real accident. And um, anytime we get near to those circumstances, uh, a, 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 uh, uh, you know, or a lost friend, or we said something that made somebody very unhappy, uh, we get near that friend, or we get near a, the site of an accident that, that uh, nearly happened or did happen, instantly our mind will go right back to that circumstance, essentially a, a spontaneous, automatic mental arrival. You'll be reminded of what happened there, and you'll be uh, on the lookout uh, not to let such things uh, happen again. Uh, those are, of course, quite functional but they are just the same amazing things that you can notice when you really learn to pay attention to a spontaneous mental arrival such as I've been discussing. So, uh, learn to watch for these and you can see it firsthand. Uh, the problem solving brain's very amazing abilities uh, which have huge brain science implications that follow from uh, such a study uh, when properly understood. Now, direct experience with watching sudden mental arrivals, understanding what they mean, and, um, and maybe even writing them down will become the basis for what you must do uh, to understand our conscious mind and such studies are the only way to do it. Now, a, uh, a further, I've been talking previously about the partial fit. Um, and uh, both writing composition uh, and uh, uh, the case of the Chrome uh, browser uh, with a fuzzy patch. Uh, the, another uh, partial fit mental arrival situation, a little bit harder to understand, but um, uh, the mechanism behind our ability to easily see similarity, simile, analogy, metaphor, uh, allegory and uh, metanone uh, are uh, uh, together abilities of our own mind to see, as in the case of analogy, 
an analogy is here's one circumstance where you, you can realize that, you know, what's there, but then there's another circumstance similar to it. And uh, a lot of things are the same, but thing in our brain recognizes the partial amount here that fits the partial amount over here. Partial fit uh, enables us to see analogy. I'm, I'm saying that uh, similar abilities uh, happen in the other um, actions of our mind, uh, which I call, uh, which I call um, uh, SPA, S-P-A. These are sympathetic uh, uh, mental, sympathetic parent, sorry again, sympathetic um, metaphoric arrivals. So, uh, which include um, a similarity, simile, analogy, metaphor, uh, allegory, and metanony, and, and others. So, uh, quite an important topic. I really can't say much more about it. But uh, in my webpage, uh, which is uh, called a Partial Fit, uh, you'll see exactly the same topic can, uh, talk, um, written out. Uh, just look for SPA, or a Sympathetic um, um, metaphoric arrivals. Now another uh, uh, partial fit, uh, but quite a bit different, uh, happens uh, uh, in what I, uh, in this uh, Starbucks uh, logo. You, you surely you recognize this on, on your Starbucks uh, coffee uh, purchases and the packaging uh, in lots of different ways. And uh, this is a uh, Another example of what I call partial fit, because um, here our minds, what's delivered to our mind, or our problem-solving brain, is just partial parts of an image of a, a real beautiful person. Just in the simplest and barest line drawings, uh, uh, but just the same, our, our problem-solving mind can see that this is a beautiful lady. Uh, her eyes are uh, have a twinkle in them and a bit of a happiness expression, and there's a, just a wisp of a smile on her lips. Partial fit, our brain can pick it out and see in this um, beautiful lady, the wisp of a smile, the, the crinkle happiness in her eyes. Now, uh, moving ahead um, is a, um, an, another more difficult um, uh, action, uh, which is, involves seeing a, a three-dimensional uh, viewing task. Now, I'll talk as I uh, turn on the projector here. Uh, the, uh, this is on my computer. i got to bring it up, too, which I hope will um, get going here in just a minute. So uh, you all know about the stereopticon, you know, where you can see uh, uh, three-dimensional Im images. Uh, those are uh, 100 years ago, people used them, stereopticon. I'll try to be loud enough you can hear me. Um, and I gotta type in my password here, excuse me. So what I want to show you is um, uh, down here at the bottom, uh, that uh, uh, drawing, I turned the lights off here. Um, projector came up just fine, thank you. Anyway, um, uh, with a um, stereopticon, uh, uh, there are two pictures that with a stereopticon device, you, they help you see each eye, see a different, uh, each eye sees on the left-hand side one view, the right eye sees another view, and uh, the two eyes, your brain will put together the images of the two eyes and make a three-dimensional image. The same thing happens in a Viewmaster. Uh, the thing you had as a child, you put the round disc in there and, and you look in there, and each eye separately has a slightly different view, and your brain assembles uh, these two views uh, into three dimensions, lots of fun. Uh, now, uh, back in the 70s, organic chemists were very, very proud of their ability to uh, know the position of all the different atoms in a large uh, organic molecule. 
and uh, even to the extent that they could figure out in three dimensions what the three-dimensional relationship of all the different molecules were in a large uh, organic molecule. Well, they wanted to put these results in a magazine, which of course is flat paper. So they can't couldn't supply a Viewmaster uh, with the magazine. So they showed the two pictures, right and left, separately on flat paper, a printed magazine page. And now the viewer had to learn how to see these without the help of a Viewmaster. Uh, for example, um, you, uh, you could try it on this screen, uh, and uh, or you may, what you may have to do is eventually stop this video we give you more time to watch this. But anyway, to see these two images now in three dimensions is um, uh, something that um, uh, you could possibly do on paper, uh, as I did with other audiences, um, uh, uh, to show how to see these without the Viewmaster. Uh, you either this image or, uh, for example, somebody on paper, you look off to the distance at uh, something and then without changing the focus of your eyes, you come down slowly and look at the, um, uh, the two images side by side. And what you will see uh, is a, uh, uh, the image on the, on the left, you'll see an image on the right, and if you're doing things right, uh, these, uh, there's a scramble of two images in the middle, uh, which is kind of a mixture. And um, in that mixture, you'll see uh, two hexagons, uh, one of which is this one and one of which is that one. In the, the scramble in the middle, you watch the two hexagons and your problem-solving brain spontaneously, automatically, just keep watching, relax, keep watching, and these two hexagons will move closer together and if they get close enough, plop! They'll fit on top of each other, and then bloop, the whole image will be available in three dimensions. And I, I was giving a talk like this a couple years ago, and uh, one person has, was actually in that case using the paper, and I heard them go, oh, and started laughing because they suddenly uh, saw the, uh, these two pictures now in three dimensions fused together automatically by their problem-solving brain. And now what's uh, important to notice here is the following. Uh, this is a fairly difficult task. And what's important about it is it slows down your brain, slows down your problem-solving brain, so you can watch your mind as it struggles with a very, very hard task, in essence, in slow motion. And uh, so, and then work on it, and work on it, work on it, and you get better at it and better at it. I guess you'd have to say um, each stage of better and better is partial fit, uh, starting um, uh, uh, to the point where finally, when you finally get a good overlap and infusing of the images to make three dimensions, uh, it's, it's success. Ooh, and a good three-dimensional view, the partial fit has gone to really good partial fit. Uh, and you now have a three-dimensional image. Uh, I hope you'll be able to work with that in your own time, perhaps stopping the video. Well, that's uh, one, uh, this, uh, this picture, I should emphasize, or is um, um, uh, sort of like uh, uh, viewing um, the crater. You gotta work at it and work at it to get it to happen correctly. Now at this point, uh, let's see, um, I want to now give a, a, um, uh, a summary. Let me turn off the projector and, and um, get the room lights back on. Excuse me a minute. Um, that's that. And, um, so uh, uh, Mike, I'd like now to uh, give a closure, a bit of a summary, uh, which goes like this. Um, the, the study of uh, sudden mental arrivals uh, uh, and, and their meaning and being very careful to understand the different varieties of them and to realize that your problem-solving brain spontaneously or automatically is putting together the best view, a nearly best, or either best or near best view, and there's only one solution, only one solution at a time. 
and um, you should um, uh, think about it. The following important um, properties is that at, uh, earlier at the beginning, there's no awareness. There's you don't see anything. There's um, uh, in, in, in a new situation like the, the puzzle picture of the Dalmatian or the or the seeing in uh, the three-dimensional uh, uh, organic molecule is not there. But um, uh, after the studying the uh, working at the problem, you finally get a, a, an answer. Uh, it's called a solution. And this, this solution is, um, comes all at once. And it's clearly and uh, uh, whole. The whole thing is there completely. Uh, and there's uh, with no leftover pieces. It's all of a sudden all there, whole, complete. And uh, what you'll notice is along with the solution, there is feelings about this. Is this good or bad? With the uh, solution also uh, are emotions. One of the emotions is anger. If it's anger, it means attack, doesn't matter what. Another emotion with that comes with the solution automatically is possibly fear, which means run away or caution. Um, uh, avoid what's coming. Of course, there can be happiness or there can be sadness, right, with the solution. And at the same time, um, the, uh, with, with the solution always is a plan. Every solution has a plan for future action. These are really intentions to do something. And with the plan and the intention, you have a feeling that, yes, I can do it. I have the capability. I'm well balanced. My my mind is straight. I'm clear headed. I don't have any dizziness. I can do the plan and move ahead. And um, the important thing to notice that all of these things occur all at once, from essentially no connection to a complete connection, and uh, giving you a a, a, a powerful um, a, a powerful abilities. And please notice that this is true about how we function. Now, uh, here you may be thinking, well, uh, what's going on? Help us understand. Where is this coming from? Uh, how could the brain be doing this? And uh, one of the things I have to say here is that to understand mind, uh, or what I've been talking about, it, it, the single most vital clue for you to understand is the is supplied by the Princeton theoretical physicist J.J. Hopfield's neuronal network model. And uh, the Hopfield model tells us in broad brushstrokes how a collection of interconnected neurons spontaneously, unsupervised, automatically, following its own rules, uh, might be able to find single, one at a time, optimal best or near best solutions or answers. The um, the uh, spontaneous uh, action uh, in the uh, Hopfield model, uh, where many neurons interact together in a network giving an answer, is a, a very analogous, very, uh, quite analogous to chemical reactions. Many molecules interacting with each other will suddenly spontaneously go uh, to a complete reaction. So there's a good analogy for you to consider. Uh, also, the Hopfield theory uh, well fits uh, brains that can be built up through Darwinian evolution, and the Hopfield model well fits brains that can be created um, uh, as a child uh, from birth, from a fertilized egg, and then growing to adult, uh, dynamically learning and developing. Uh, so, and the, um, also, uh, neuronal networks as Hopfield proposes well fit what we see is obvious behavior in animals and ourselves, both mentally and subsequent bodily actions. In fact, it is ultimately seen that the finding of a single, one at a time, optimal best or near best solution or answer is, a, is effectively a guiding principle for all living animals and perhaps even growing vegetation. Best or near best is a guiding principle for animals and and uh, living uh, life. And um, so keeping in mind all of this, second by second, each successive moment, uh, the primary critician, cr the primary critician 
criteria, excuse me, for the operation of the brain and that of animals, where each momentary solution always brings with it feelings, emotions, future plans, intentions, uh, and the knowledge of whether or not you can do it. So, um, uh, what needs to be said here is that all of these, um, what I've been discussing, and how our uh, proto-theory, how our mind works, it's uh, quite to understand, hard to understand, let alone to believe it. Now the reasons for the hard to believe, hard to understand is we have absolutely no conscious clue as to any one of the uh, mentioned unconscious brain processes. It is totally out of our awareness. And uh, another uh, thing that makes the theory hard to understand is that the, the sudden mental arrival, a flash of insight, is rather illogical. It's fantastic that, and unbelievable, that remarkable, good solutions and answers can appear just out of the blue into our conscious mind. Uh, and these uh, happen automatically with no guidance from our conscious mind whatsoever. We don't even know them are happening. And um, always, as you have been able, to, I've been able to emphasize, these solutions which are best or near best, are just exactly what is intimate, immediately needed in response to life's problems coming at us. And properly understood, the problem-solving brain is uh, the wellspring and the source and mechanism of all human creativity, including social creativity. Think of that. All creativity comes out of our problem-solving brain. Now, so for the above reasons uh, uh, about my uh, uh, theory being so hard to understand is uh, it will be so unfamiliar to you that your study of it, learning about it, perhaps on my web pages, or two of them where I've written this up, I'll give a link in a minute, uh, uh, your studying this may take as what uh, Robert Persig said, uh, a rearrangement of a lot of intellectual furniture a uh, philosopher, ancient philosopher, excuse me, a hundred years ago, a uh, philosopher, Immanuel Kant, said uh, to learn about such a thing was a Copernican revolution. Or as Thomas Kuhn said in his book, um, um, uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, you'll have to have a paradigm shift to learn my theory. Now, a, a Copernican revolution, uh, according to Kant, is the following. Uh, by, this, uh, by the term Copernican Revolution, Kant referred to Cop the uh, Copernicus statement that the Earth moved around the Sun rather than the Earth being fixed and the Sun going around the Earth. When you saw this, uh, Earth went around the Sun as a planet. Nothing had changed as a result of this um, um, new view, this revolution, yet everything had changed. To put it in Kantian terms, the objective world producing our sense data had not changed, but our priori concept of what of, of it was turned inside out. The effect was overwhelming. And I think uh, what I'm trying to say here is that if you learn my theory from what I said this, here in this talk and uh, reading my web pages, uh, you will have an overwhelming effect and ability to see anew uh, how your mind works. So, uh, and now uh, what I'll show at the uh, with uh, this video uh, recording is a uh, links where you can read my web pages and explanation how to get there. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, hearing me out, and this is the end of this recording.